All right, so welcome everybody. Uh, great to see you guys here. I'm very excited uh, that we have the next speaker here in our CIO talk series. Uh, it's Astrid Schober, great for having you. Uh, I'd say just a few words. Uh, so um, she's from uh, Western Styria. Uh, we chatted about that uh, for a little uh, moment. Um, and um, uh, she started working uh, for a startup very early. She continued with Accenture and uh, working for a corporate uh, OMV, just like around the corner. Uh, and she is now uh, with Wien Energie. So uh, pretty excited to see um, how you combine uh, the startup versus corporate and innovation perspectives here also in your talk on how blockchain might be a game changer for the energy sector. Very much looking forward to that. Thanks for being with us. Thank you very much uh, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak about a topic I am personally very excited about. Uh, just as a first uh, thing, I have not mutated to a cyborg. It just turns out that female clothing is equipped with way too less pockets, so we couldn't find a place where to store the microphone. So it's now up in my sleeve, so nothing hidden there. It's just really uh, the microphone and we really have to have a chat with the female clothing manufacturers. It's always too less pockets. So um, Jan asked me to also uh, elaborate a little bit more about my CV. Uh, I studied computer science in Graz and uh, I've always been a kind of a computer person, uh, even in the, in the 90s when there were those uh, big machines and big screens, but it was always something that I had a heart for. So my first job actually led me into a small uh, software company, uh, but then it was called a spin-off of the Technical University uh, of Graz. Uh, it was knowledge management software. It was really hot and, and trending and all the companies were suffocating in a lot of data and they didn't know how to organize uh, their information and they were really looking uh, for solutions in order to organize uh, the data and uh, to actually gain insights uh, and knowledge out of the data. So it was really when the internet became a, a big thing, there was a huge flood of information. And that's actually what we are confronted uh, now uh, some uh, 20 years later uh, with the transfer of value uh, in addition to the transfer of information in the internet. And we in Wien Energy believe that blockchain is one of the foundation technologies that does enable this transfer of value. If you look into the past, there have always been inventions that have changed the society. Uh, think about uh, the light bulb uh, that wasn't even invented by Thomas Alpha Edison. But what he did is he uh, designed uh, the whole distribution grid architecture so all the households could uh, have access to electricity, which was, which was a really big thing in the 1880s, 1890s. So he actually designed a foundation uh, infrastructure and this was the value add uh, for the society back then. Wien Wien Energy believe that the blockchain is another one of such foundation, foundation technologies. There is an interesting uh, book uh, by uh, Don Tapscott. He was a very uh, revolutionary in, uh, in the topic of blockchain and the technology. Uh, it's a really good foundational read for you if you want to really understand the basics and where uh, the blockchain and the blockchain applications came from. Uh, it was co-authored by his son, uh, Alex Tapscott. And Alex Tapscott uh, said on Twitter, yeah, Bitcoin is an interesting use case, but the best applications uh, of the blockchain are yet to come. So what I would like uh, to talk about today is really step one, what are the basics? How does this blockchain work? Uh, how do we use cryptography to actually transfer value from one person to the other without having to trust this person? Then we will take a closer look at energy-related applications. Uh, I will also give you an insight about the, the concrete projects that we have worked on over the past two, two and a half years uh, in Wien Energie and how we uh, imagine the future and what are our next steps and how are we set up as a team in order to, to really make a, a business model out of blockchain based applications. So uh, is blockchain a hyped topic? 
who of you has heard about the blockchain? Okay. <laughs> who of you can explain how a blockchain works in just three sentences? <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Very good. So, um, I really like to work with the Gartner hype cycle. Are you familiar with this, uh, with this concept? Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> So this is a, a typical Gartner or change management or whatever hype cycle. So what happens here, a technology is invented. This is uh, what, what happened when uh, Satoshi Nakamoto designed uh, first, or his uh, the pseudonym, uh, designed firstly how such a distributed ledger uh, uh, blockchain technology works. That was somewhere in the zero years and it has grown. Then I believe we arrived here like two years ago when all the big companies suddenly woke up and, and, uh, and understood there is something out there. We don't really understand it, but it may be a threat to our business model. So all the big banks uh, woke up and uh, all the bosses and the CEOs of the big banks told their innovation department, what's, what's going on with this blockchain thing? I really need to, to make uh, projects there. Let's invest. Let's see what's uh, behind this uh, this uh, technology trend there. So I, I'd say that was the 2015, 16 and following. And then and Gartner calls the, uh, this uh, the top of inflated expectations. So this is really the hype uh, where we are at the moment. But what happened in the, next, in the last one or two years is more and more companies uh, did invest in blockchain projects and we learned. Wien Energy learned and all the other companies learned that, yeah, there is something behind this technology, but it's not solving all our issues. It's a small puzzle part that you can use carefully and in, in the best areas and then you really uh, get something out of it, you get some value out of it. But the technology itself, it doesn't have value. It's what you build out of it and how you cleverly include it in new applications uh, that support new business models. And this is where we are right now. Gartner calls it the draft of dis disillusionment or in German I would say the Stahl der Tränen. And this is where a lot of companies then lose interest. Uh, we've tried something, it hasn't worked. But this is what we believe where our work in Wien Energie starts. We have learned a lot, we've built up a team, we have developers now, we understand the technology, and now we need to really think carefully, okay, what could be the differentiator for us as an energy company? And there is quite a lot ongoing, I will explain it later in the energy sector, and we believe that blockchain actually has its value there, and we, can, we will build new business models based on blockchain or distributed ledger technology. So that was just a short excursus to the hype cycle. As I mentioned, it is overhyped. Uh, there was a lot of venture capitalist companies who were throwing money after small startups with two or three people because they had an idea, it sounded cool, there was blockchain involved. And we had many, uh, we are working a lot also with startups at Wien Energy, and we had many startups pitching us their idea, what they wanted to do, and then we asked them, so that sounds like a pretty normal application. Why did you actually include uh, blockchain technology there? It's really not suited uh, for this problem. And the simple answer was, well, it sells. So if you include blockchain or blockchain technology in your product, it just sells to venture capitalists. It, it's, uh, it uh, sells to people who want to explore and invest in the technology. And a lot of uh, those projects just didn't really make sense. And in parallel to that, uh, the value of Bitcoin uh, went skyrocketing before it crashed like any ladder or bubble. So we still think uh, blockchain technology is a way to decentralize the internet. And when I say decentralize, I mean the transfer of value using the internet. The internet has helped a lot in democratizing information, in giving a lot of people access to information, but there was still the problem of how then to also, um, to also exchange value. Uh, those of you who still 
uh, were listening to CDs uh, back then in the 90s before you could download and stream everything. Now that you had to go to a store, uh, you had to buy the music and therefore the, the artist uh, got, got his uh, remuneration. Uh, nowadays, everyone is streaming, you're just downloading your music. What if you could have uh, a microtransaction for every song you're downloading uh, instead of those flat fees that uh, the big providers are offering you and the artist could profit from, uh, this, uh, from this transaction immediately. You would exclude uh, the man in the middle, but the value could uh, arrive at the artist uh, who has performed this song directly and there would be no, uh, no margins, no interference in between. So that would be the end of a lot of business models like Amazon, who is a huge platform provider, Apple, Facebook, Google, they're all, they're all uh, uh, profiting as a platform provider, as being the central who takes his uh, share uh, of income there. But what's actually really behind the blockchain technology? The blockchain technology creates trust. With digital goods, you can copy them uh, one million times. It doesn't really matter. But if it is, uh, if it is a, a digital uh, ledger, if it is your uh, Grundbuch, so the property uh, registry, you don't want to have it copied. Yeah? You want to ensure that this digital good only exists once and that there is an owner, a dedicated owner to this digital good. Because then, you can prove that you're the owner of the good and you can transfer the value to the next person without having someone in the middle. This will create the internet of value. If you look at it in specific cases, you had uh, the first uh, humans who did this, uh, uh, transactions, then there was the age of explorations, uh, there was the industrial peak where everything went really centralized uh, from information uh, to value and then the internet arrived and all of a sudden there was some more access to information and information became more democratized again. And we believe uh, the same will happen with the internet of value. So let's take uh, a few concrete examples. At the beginning, when it was just about hunting and, and fishing and collecting, there was very direct uh, human transactions. Uh, you were interacting uh, with the next person who owned a good that you desired and you were trading with this person. There was no intermediary in between, it was just a face-to-face -face transaction. You can see here, it's really based on a personal uh, connection and on oral information transfer. Then in the age of, uh, of exploration, there were organized states, uh, there were people who were in charge of transferring information from one city to the other, whether they were walking or riding, but there was trusted people who transferred information and informed people in the different villages about news that the king has decided, whatever. Um, also, uh, the, the the trust creation was done by a trusted person. There were markets, there were merchants, uh, goods were being sold. But it was still not completely centralized. That came with the industrial peak. When you had very central agencies uh, like, the, uh, like big banks, uh, like the, the governments, like we know it now, where everything uh, was concentrated. We now have uh, uh, our, all our property is registered in one central register, it's called uh, the Grundbuch and there is certain uh, trusted uh, persons, the notare, the notaries, who are entitled to change entries in the Grundbuch or uh, property registry after they have checked everything. So this is a very nice example of such an intermediary, but also an energy company. An energy company uh, produces and delivers energy to any household. Uh, Wien Energy has uh, two million uh, customers uh, for electricity and, and gas. So we are actually one of those central intermediaries. And we have a central, we have central systems where we do all the, uh, where we receive the metering data and then we, uh, we do the billing and you receive at the end of the day 
every month uh, your electricity bill. Then the internet came along and information was actually uh, transferred to anyone by anyone. So you, uh, all of a sudden uh, people had access to any kind of information in, in large quantities. Uh, but for payment, you still need a trusted institution. Now also the payment providers have evolved, uh, like PayPal, uh, like all the, all the other uh, companies that allow you to buy uh, and sell goods in the internet and that act as a trusted uh, institution. What if you don't need PayPal anymore? Because you can really exchange uh, information and also transfer value over the internet. And this is actually what uh, I believe that the blockchain technology will enable us to do in the future. Now, I already mentioned Wien Energy as one of those players in, in the centralized area. Uh, this is actually uh, one of the driver why we are looking deeply into the possibilities and also the pitfalls of blockchain because we decided not to be scared and afraid of this technology but to see what new business models can we uh, take out of it. When not the central institution or the central utility is actually uh, providing value, but it's all individuals interacting with each, with each other and allowing them also uh, to actually exchange value between each other. Now I want to dive a little bit deeper into the technicalities uh, behind, behind the blockchain. As uh, the name already says, uh, it's some kind of new kind of decentralized data storage that is built out of blocks, out of blocks of transactions, out of blocks of different kinds of data. And every participant in such a blockchain network has a full copy of all the data. This is something that wasn't possible like 10 years ago because storage space was way too expensive. We all have our little USB sticks. Uh, some years ago, there was only a very limited amount of, of data that you could store on a USB stick. You had to have these external um, plates in order to carry around your data. Nowadays, storage cost is close to zero. Uh, it's available to anyone. There is network bandwidth available. Internet access is uh, spread, uh, is extremely widespread. Everyone has access to the internet nowadays. And this was actually the, the enabling factors for a technology like blockchain. So every participant has a complete copy of all the transactions in a blockchain. And because there are many participants uh, in this network, uh, you can validate that actually the data is not compromised. If you look at this example here, we see that our participants 5, 4, 1, 2, all have the same uh, data in the blocks but not this one. Participant three has, has data in there that doesn't seem to be valid. Something must have gone wrong there. And why do we know it? Because everyone else uh, has, a, has different data in this block, uh, in this block M, but not participant three. So this block will actually be discarded in the blockchain. It's not a valid block. So what do those blocks contain? It's just a digital storage container that can, that can actually store any kind of data. Uh, in our case and in the case of bitcoins, it's storing transactions. Uh, it's storing transactions and it's actually also including a security feature called a hash. For those of you who are familiar with cryptography, um, a hash is something like a digital fingerprint uh, that can ensure that uh, a block of data or an electronic document is valid. So every one of those blocks, uh, in, so every one of those trans transactions in the blockchain is combined together in the block and then a, a hash function is being added. So a hash function is calculated from every one of those transactions, uh, you calculate a hash function and you include it in the next block. And then you include new transactions 
when the block is full, you put a new hash function and you include it in the next block. So actually the different blocks in the blockchain are interconnected and the hash function ensures uh, that it cannot be changed. Because when you change just a single, uh, a single bit in this information, the hash will be completely different. And since it's all built up from, uh, from block to block on the blockchain, you just cannot change it. So, what's important to know about the hash function? It's a one-way function. If you look at the hash value itself, and I will show you later an example for a hash value, you cannot calculate back to the data behind. You can only ensure that all the transactions combined in there, added together, and put into a hash function makes up this hash. But there is no way back. It's extremely storage efficient. Now, we learned before that every participant in the blockchain has the full copy of the full repository. Using those hash functions actually does compress the data. There's different kinds of hash functions and they're used in all different kinds of contexts like electronically signing documents, uh, doing public private key, verschlüsselung. Uh, 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 no. uh, uh, the, uh, encryption. Uh, so completely out of the context of blockchain. But it was one of the enabling building blocks uh, for blockchain technology. I would like to show you if it works, how such a, a hash function can look like. Uh, you can access this, uh, this portal, anders.com blockchain, and you can see how a hash function is being calculated. So if I write here the famous hello world, you can see that with every letter that I type, the hash changes completely. So I just remove the exclamation mark and you have a completely different kind of hash. How does this uh, look like in a blockchain? In a blockchain, you have a block number, you have the nonce, I'll explain that in a second, then you have a different transactions. Transaction one, transaction two. So, uh, if I list my transactions, uh, it's rather simple to make a hash function out of it and put it in a block. But this is not secure enough uh, for the blockchain technology. This is why uh, this nonce number is included. And uh, the specifics of this nonce uh, number is actually to make it more complex in order to make more work happen in the, black, uh, in the background and to make this transaction uh, more secure. Actually, the hashing algorithm now has to work, also include uh, this nonce number and uh, in the in the context of blockchain, you have to do a lot of calculations and generate a hash that starts with a specific number of zeros. So in our case, we have defined that in our blockchain architecture, we want a valid hash always to start with four zeros. In the Bitcoin world, it's a lot more zeros, but you have seen it's a complex calculation there is this random nonce number, so you have to try all kinds of different nonce numbers in order to come up with a hash that has uh, four uh, zeros at the beginning. So a lot of computers in the blockchain network need to do a lot of work. And this is what the, the so-called mining is actually doing. And in the Bitcoin world, those who come up as the first ones with the valid hash get a fee for this transaction. They get a certain number of Bitcoins in order to do it. Now there is, uh, there is more uh, examples. Uh, you can go through this. There's also a tutorial in behind, but if you have more than one block, then you start with the first block, you include the hash of the, of the next block, you include the hash of the next block, but after every block is complete, you, you, you do this mining, you calculate the correct hash, you add it to the next block. So I can show it here with two <laughs> blocks. So I do the mining. Now this hash is included as the previous hash in the next block. 
I do the transaction to, I mine again, and this valid hash is actually again included in the, in the next block. So it's, uh, I think it's a, it's a really nice example website that uh, actually gives it a little bit more understanding how does a hash look like. Does it really change completely if I temper just with one uh, single letter, if I add just a, a period, whatever? Yes, definitely it does. And this is, uh, this is why cryptography is such a powerful enabler for the, for the blockchain world. And this is actually why the blockchain is known as burning uh, a lot of energy. It's actually not the transactions, it's really this generating uh, a valid new hash. Uh, and this is what we call a consensus mechanism. Uh, and this consensus mechanism is actually the, the the part in the process that does consume so much energy. Also interesting for us as an energy company, is there a business model maybe in it for us? We believe no, not at the moment. There is miners in China who can produce at a much, 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 much lower cost. So uh, we decided uh, that this is not uh, a business for us. I already explained the mining concept here right uh, online. But what I would really like you to, to remember is, it's called the blockchain because the data is stored in storage blocks. Blocks are linked by a cryptographic chain. The hash function enables an efficient process. And it's the consensus mechanism that validates data correctness. And only this consensus mechanism is where the, the really lot of work and energy consumption starts. But there is different consensus mechanisms Bitcoin is, is using proof of work. Uh, this is very, a very inefficient, very hard process, but it was designed that way. So it would be the most secure uh, cryptographic currency. What we have also seen, uh, blockchain projects were overhyped. Whatever was done between 2015 and 2017 is now dead. Same applies for the projects that VS Wiener Energy did in 2017. It was interesting proof of concepts, but it's not a product that we have out and that our customers are using. What we also learned is we have to do our homework. Not to every problem, blockchain is a solution. So develop, we developed uh, some kind of decision tree. If my use case does not involve a database, blockchain is not a good idea. If there is only one user updating my database, I don't need a blockchain. I can use a simple, uh, a simple uh, relational database in order to accomplish my use case. Do users need to trust each other? Is there value being uh, transported? Only if users don't trust each other, I should use a blockchain-based uh, technology. Then we ask ourselves, would adding a third party at extra cost, would it make my process inefficient? If no, let's work with a third party. It's not that, it's not that cost intensive and it makes our process simpler. And then the final question is, do those transactions depend on or interact with each other? Only in that case, if I have said yes to every one of these decision points, then it is a good idea to use blockchain technology. So for us, it was really when we were screening uh, all those startups, all those ideas that came along, can we not do this with blockchain? Sure, we can do it with blockchain, but we can do it with, uh, with a simple client server application as well. And it's actually faster and cheaper. Because this is actually, uh, this is actually the point Bitcoin is very slow. So this, uh, this consensus algorithm is really something I should only use when, I'm, when I am transferring high volumes of value, not for microtransactions. Do you have any questions at this point? Because there is now I will dive into uh, what does it mean for us as an energy company and what are energy specific use cases. So if you have questions just about the technology, now is a good point or when, when we are done with the rest of the use cases.
So I have no clue about blockchain. This is actually the reason why I'm here. Mm -hmm. What I don't get is how people get to know about this kind of blockchain. Because normally if you say, um, okay, there are multiple people that would be interested in, but what if people would like to join? How would you, how, how would they know that this blockchain exists? I'm sorry for this question, but do you, do, do you get my idea? Mm -hmm. Because when you say there is an intimate diary, for instance, Facebook, mm -hmm. Facebook is basically ad administrating the entire platform, but who does it with blockchain? Who does, let's let's get, let's say to go on the market mm -hmm. to really to really promote mm -hmm. this database? Mm -hmm. Thank you for this question. Uh, it's uh, it's a very interesting one. So what we have seen over the past couple of years uh, in in the field of blockchain is that there is rarely like already completely full life applications uh, operating based on blockchain technology. There is several examples, for example, in the in the nonprofit organization world, where it's a common problem that donations get lost on the way. So there is big NGOs uh, who are working on solution where blockchain technology makes it able to trace the donations. So by using uh, certain uh, cryptocurrencies and storing the transaction in a blockchain, you can also always know who's at the moment holding this, uh, this value, this money. It is, it is very transparent because every transaction is stored in the blockchain. Everyone can look into it and you know that uh, the mayor of the village uh, such and such in Zimbabwe is currently holding this donation. Then there is, uh, there is different kinds of projects, but uh, what typically happens, uh, they provide you an easy access point. They provide you a wallet, a cryptocurrency wallet. You can now they download the cryptocurrency wallet and you can, um, you can exchange uh, your euros in any kind of cryptocurrencies and you only refer from your wallet uh, to the cryptocurrency coins that you are owning. And it's stored on the blockchain that you are currently owning uh, those, uh, those uh, coins, those cryptocurrency coins. So there is apps, there is uh, all kinds of applications that allow you to access and to do transactions. And in that case, you don't have to participate uh, in this huge blockchain universe and you have to download everything. You can simply start by just using a cryptocurrency wallet or whatever identity wallet is also something that, is, that a lot of companies are working. But it's, as you have seen in the hype cycle, it's very immature. There's not a lot of uh, really live applications out there. There have been some use cases in the energy sector uh, that we're working with microtransactions because especially when you're charging electric vehicles such as um, uh, bicycles, it's very small amounts uh, that you have to pay. And it was in the past very inefficient for an energy provider uh, to bill you for these very small transactions. But with blockchain technology, actually those microtransactions could become uh, a business case for us. Um, so you said at the start you had this quote that Bitcoin is an application of blockchain, uh, blockchain technology, but that actually much more interesting applications are still to come. Uh, so I guess my question is, is blockchain, does it need to be connected to cryptocurrency in any way? Or what are some of these other applications uh, that, that might be relevant with blockchain technology that is not yeah, uh, crypto I'm very happy related. you asked this question because that brings me exactly to our use cases from the energy industry. <laughs> Should we just have these two other questions upstairs? And then we return to your talk. <laughs> um, do you have any particular uh, use case scenarios in the energy industry which you would like to uh, use or talk about it and are you using a public or private blockchain or maybe some permission blockchain or something and both, also do you both. Um, we're looking at different architectures of the blockchain i will show you in the next chapter 
Yeah, Sen, I just wanted to ask, uh, elaborating a bit more on the uh, decision tree we had before. So, uh, if we had also some uh, rationale for pseudonymity, because it, pseudonymity, like being completely anonymous unless I want to tell you what's my private key or public key. Because otherwise I would rather go for a distributed database. And uh, also, another question is, if we may consider also another thing, which is if we really need that every transaction is in a total order, so one after the other exactly, or it's enough to know, well, this transaction happened before that and this after that. Because I think otherwise, I, I, I don't know, I'm not sure we should use a blockchain, but rather a DCV ledger. Just asking, so none, in, in the, if you had this uh, in mind also, just the simplification or anything. Right, so I guess uh, some of these questions are kind of transferring uh, to the block that uh, you will start second now. Exactly, so now let's dive into the real life and also energy uh, related applications because that's actually what we looked into uh, in the past couple of years. So what's happening in the energy sector? We're faced uh, with three trends. It's decarbonization, so we want to get rid uh, of coal-powered power plants, we've got, we want to get uh, much more into renewables. Uh, this brings uh, centralization with it because the renewables are typically, they are photovoltaic panels, they are uh, wind uh, mills, they're, they're not in a central location, they are maybe exposed. They are not always on because they, uh, if, if it's cold and it's dark, and there is no wind, then it's very hard to produce energy from renewables. There are still water power plants, uh, and we're lucky in Austria uh, to have so many water powered plants, but still uh, with all those renewables, you're looking into decentralization. And there is the di digitalization of all kinds of business processes, and this will actually also influence us and will transform, profoundly transform an industry that hasn't changed much in the last 100 years. So it's really, we are really at a disru disruptive point uh, in our industry and there is a lot of technologies that could enable us to make up new business models. So if you look at here, uh, and I'll explain it later in more detail, uh, what happened in the past was there is a centralized utility, there's a distribution provider, and you receive energy from a dedicated uh, utilities company. In the future, or it's starting also now, it gets much more complicated because, because you have your own uh, photovoltaic panels uh, on the top of your roof. You may have electric car or you may have an uh, electric bike that you want to charge at a certain uh, point of time in the day or you don't care when, it, when this is happening. You have all those renewables. You have uh, prosumers emerging, meaning uh, it's producers and consumers uh, in one person or in, in one entity. And this is something that's just new to our business. There have been a lot of energy uh, related proof of concept uh, in, in the blockchain area. Metering was one of those things because it's a, it's a very tiresome process. At the moment there are smart meters being rolled out and in the past you had to have a person who had to personally go to your meter, check the value on your meter. With the uh, electronic meters, at least uh, your meter data is transferred, but still, wouldn't it be much easier if you have all the, your usage values uh, stored in a centralized ledger and transparent for an anyone and make it very easy to also do the billing for this. Uh, there was a lot of pilots uh, for green certificates uh, because what happens in the, in the moment in the energy industry is that yes, there are CO2 certificates and you can kind of ensure that uh, the company is working with this amount of clean energy, but in the end of the day, you can still buy those certificates and have your coal power plants uh, running here in the Vienna area and still have the certificate that, hey, but I bought uh, uh, this amount of megawatt hours in, in Norway and this is why it's clean now. Uh, using blockchain technology would enable uh, the producers to say, hey, I have produced this, mega, uh, this kilowatt hour in this windmill at that point in time. So it would be really a proof of origin uh, for uh, the electricity. 
and in e-mobility, as I mentioned before, these microtransactions, these really small transactions that are just not economically feasible uh, for us as an energy company could uh, be handled using blockchain technology. This is just an overview of what was going on in the last two years. There was a lot of companies who did all kinds of proof of concept, but in the end of the day, this was typically it. What we are currently looking uh, at in detail is how, how we are going to deal with the prosumers in the future. As the system works today, uh, when you have your, your photovoltaic panels on the top of your roof, you're directly uh, connected to the distribution uh, grid. Uh, and whatever you don't use uh, in your household is delivered as excess energy uh, directly into the network and your uh, electricity company is refunding you a certain amount of money. But this actually is wasted potential. You have no, no control how you want to distribute uh, your electricity in, in a Gretzel or in an energy community with your neighbors. And by the way, whatever you deliver into the electricity grid network, also the network provider gets his share of money uh, for this one. Our vision would be that the households are interconnected uh, via a microgrid. They can share the energy between each other. They can trade the energy between the parties. When there is an under or oversupply, you can still exchange uh, balancing energy with the distribution grid because the network always has to be stable. If all the photovoltaics panels are producing and there is too few consumers, then of course you need to uh, get rid of the excess energy should you not have a powerful battery solution because that's also one of the players in the future in the market. But we want, our, want to enable our customers that they can consume the energy very close to where it is produced. So it would be a win-win situation for all parties and our business model would be to be the platform provider to enable this kind of transactions. But there are still challenges. People don't trust in the, in the new technology. Systems as they're currently set up are not transparent enough, uh, for example, for a monthly billing. Uh, there's a, a lack of data security. At the moment, not uh, using uh, blockchain technology, there is a high transaction cost. And it's difficult to participate because you can, of course, set up your peer-to-peer -peer trading platform using conventional technology, but it's complicated and it's costly and inefficient. For a blockchain-based uh, solution, the consumption and the production data is shared between all the participants, so it's always clear who produced and who consumed how much. Um, you can have some kind of local energy market and even in the further future, your household appliances themselves could trade the electricity they need. They could negotiate, the, the washing machine could negotiate a, a lower price when it's actually switching on at 2 p.m. in the afternoon uh, when actually the, the sun is shining and there's a, a lot of energy production and this could all be optimized in a far, 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 in a world far, far away from now. But this, this is a scenario that we are actually looking at. But for us, with, the, with this concept of prosumers and local energy communities, the, the minimization of transaction cost is actually the, the thing that will make or break these local energy communities. Good. I will skip that one, it's way too complicated. Um, what we also looked at different kinds of blockchain architectures, because there is a hyperledger uh, blockchain that is uh, very commonly used uh, in the energy industry. There is the, the Tendermint uh, platform that we have uh, worked with in our uh, first use case. Uh, there's Ethereum that's quite cost intensive. Uh, we learned that when we did our, our first projects. We've also looked at Yota and all, all those different uh, blockchain architectures have their different have their different uh, advantages and disadvantages. To us, in, in the energy community, speed is a very important one, but also transaction costs is actually uh, what influences our use cases most.
As I mentioned before, it's still very early for blockchain technology. We as Wiener Energie don't expect to have uh, consumer ready products in the next one or two years. We're looking more at the three to five years horizon, but we firmly believe it will come. It was slow in the past. You all know the famous story about buying uh, a pizza using the first uh, bitcoins. It's, it's a road uh, in front of us. But uh, we will get uh, to different uh, business models in the future. So uh, I'm sorry, that's a German one. But uh, token-based uh, incentives for behavioral change is one of those uh, use cases that we imagine we can realize pretty close. Because it's rather simple to create your own tokens and to incentivize uh, different kind of behavior, also to add some uh, gamification on top of that one. And we envision that this is a use case that we can uh, actually really take life in the near future. Uh, also, the documentation, so the certification of decentralized uh, electricity production is something we imagine is not very far away. We are experimenting with small uh, cryptographic chips that are built in directly into our windmills. So we can actually prove that this, kind, uh, that this energy was produced by this windmill at this time of the day. Uh, and it's safe and it's secure and it's simple. Uh, also for the charging uh, station infrastructure, we imagine that's something that's not so far away uh, uh, from the timely horizon where we actually want to write the consumption data uh, onto the blockchain. Uh, what's further in the future is uh, also to actively manage the uh, decentralized uh, energy production and then really to do that's then the furthest away in the future to have maybe different devices uh, do those transactions uh, on the blockchain. So as a summary, to us, uh, blockchain is one of the key enablers for IoT applications that include third parties and these local energy communities are actually something that uh, will uh, profit from uh, the blockchain technology. Then we want it will enable us to establish secure transactions uh, that are not that cost intensive that they were in the past. Uh, we, we are sure that it will accelerate energy transition and, cu and cut the costs, especially for the prosumers. As I mentioned, a fully fledged application to become online, that's still two to five years away for us. And there is a lot of challenges ahead, the scalability, cost of transactions, uh, also the development of the different uh, kinds of blockchains. There are so many out there. We are currently looking at Tobalaba. We, we were experimenting with Polkadot. It's, it's just, there's so much going on. There is an energy web foundation who wants to standardize blockchain applications. We at Wiener Energie just want to ensure we are part of the game. Uh, we have a small dedicated team of three people who are really exploring the technology, who are doing the coding themselves, so that we, that we are really understanding how are the developments, what can we use it for. If our product development comes with a new use case, we're quickly testing it and looking, okay, which, which of the blockchains available are actually suit, uh, suitable for this business case, and does it make sense? But, for us, it's important to do it ourselves, to really build up the knowledge so that uh, we are in a position to really make uh, informed decisions and uh, can challenge any new startup, any new provider that comes uh, along with a good idea. Yeah. This is how we are set up at Wien Energy. I have still a lot of more use cases in more detail, but I think it's more interactive if you just ask me your questions directly and I answer them as well as I can. All right, so this is a great call. Thank you very much for uh, working towards your backup slides. So who have more questions? Let's start here. I continue then with you. So you showed the new energy system and how it should work. Where do you see the source for it? This is a very good question. We've been asking ourselves this question for a while now. We are developing use cases. One of these cases uh, would be to be the platform provider. Because 
there has been a new uh, European Union legislation that's actually uh, very much in favor of the local energy com uh, communities. It is currently being translated into Austria, Austria's legislation. But uh, this EU re regulation wants to stimulate local energy communities. Uh, they want to really uh, give a drive in there. But there is no system currently in place to manage those uh, energy communities. And uh, we believe it, the consumer doesn't care so much where his electricity comes from. Uh, if it is local, it is fine, but he doesn't want to do actively trading, well, maybe some of them do, but they just want to have uh, a full supply of, uh, of local energy. And if the local energy is not uh, enough, then they want to source uh, more energy out of the of network. Someone needs to manage this. And we as an energy company know how to manage this. Uh, we know how to, how to do the billing and we know how to uh, balance the grid and we know all the mechanisms behind. So we could be the platform provider and whenever some local energy community uh, is established, uh, we could deliver them as a service, the management of the platform. This is one of the use cases we're looking at. Another question is here. Please show me your hand if you have more questions. Hi, my, um, my question is regarding energy consumption. Uh, as I understand, you are looking into possibility connecting all of the participants, also uh, customers, and all of the customers will have the same, the same information. And blockchain, is the biggest criticism of blockchain uh, technology is the electricity consumption. Uh, how how does it work? I mean, it's a lot of a lot of information. Um, just <laughs> is it energy? Yeah, it's it's going to be so. And you're saying that it's going to uh, save cost, but it's going to be so. If I understand correctly, it's going to be so expensive. <laughs> 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 and how does it work? Yeah, thank you for this question. Um, this is why I was referring to different types of the blockchain or distributed ledger technology as a wider um, definition of how it works. Uh, there's really a lot of different architectures out there. Uh, there is one blockchain where every, everything uh, is stored on the blockchain uh, like Ethereum. Then there is other blockchains where you have side chains between the participants of the blockchain where only specific information is stored. At. Then as, I'm, as I explained before, a lot of the cost of blockchain comes from the consensus algorithm. And in the case of Bitcoin, it's a very costly one because those transactions need to be massively secure. But maybe for energy transactions, we don't need that much uh, of security because we're just logging who has consumed how much. When it comes to transfer of value, uh, it's usually a different kind of story. But there is a lot of different architectures evolving. And to us, it's always important to test them. How much, how much does a transaction cost here? Is it fast enough to us? Uh, we had a first use case where we were doing trade confirmation. So whenever you, you buy something on the energy market, you agree, the trader between the trader agrees, uh, I want to buy this much uh, uh, energy. And then they exchange trading confirmations and then the whole thing gets into the settlement and the back office. There we needed speed. We needed to be able to process like a thousand uh, transactions per second. So we looked at, um, at a specific type of blockchain that was actually able uh, to uh, work with that many transactions per, per second. Uh, then uh, we also uh, looked into other blockchain, always depending on the use case. And the more we experiment uh, with the different architectures, the more we learn that they are also different. And for all are a good solution for a specific problem, but there is not one blockchain solution for all the use cases that are around. Not for energy, but also not for the financial services industry, that, which is one of the industries that is very closely looking into the blockchain. Maybe not yet. I mean, it's still a long Yeah. Time. This is why we don't expect uh, that we have a product that's ready for our customers before two to five years. It really depends. The use case about uh, the energy origination certifications, that looks like a very promising one because it's quite simple. Another question is here. Yeah. Um, well, 
what I was uh, I was wondering um, if you're talking about blockchain um, used in microgrids. Um, how do you think will this work in cities? Because um, as I understood it, um, it the, in a microgrid you need to have um, many producers as well. So do you think in cities there will be um, solar panels on the roofs of, or, or how does this work in cities? And do you think you can um, you can offer a service for um, customers in cities to um, become producers? Because yeah. That's actually exactly what uh, Wien Energy is doing at the moment. So we're uh, working with uh, constru uh, construction organizations, uh, for example, of, of social uh, buildings. Uh, and we want to equip uh, as many of the roofs uh, of Vienna citizens uh, with solar panels. They can also be uh, uh, big houses uh, with, with many parties and actually in, in, in those houses with many parties uh, it, it works quite well because there is different uh, there is one uh, common uh, photovoltaic uh, panel on the rooftop and uh, all the participants uh, of the house can actually consume this energy. Exactly, exactly. It's, uh, we believe that with the new EU regulation regarding citizen energy communities, that's how the regulation is called, this will be pushed much further and there will be, there will be standards. Uh, we also talked uh, to Econtrol, which is our Austrian local uh, regulator, and they all expect that uh, there will be much more of those prosumers. There will be many more rooftops equipped uh, also with photovoltaic uh, because now it's legally possible to share this information also between houses but this was not the case in the past you could only have one uh, photovoltaic panel on top of your roof and you could deliver electricity to your own household and maybe also to neighbors but it couldn't leave the building it couldn't cross the street and but this will change with this new regu regulation we just don't know how it looks like exactly what another question is here uh, I have a question uh, concerning his uh, how how are, are there any calculations how how much uh, there will be at uh, yeah just 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 rooftops how much uh, photovoltaic uh, yeah there will be in the next future and uh, concerning the slides you've uh, showed before uh, the applications. Um, is there any, so, so what hardware do we need to uh, do all these applications? Because I'm living in a house now where we don't even have such things as a smart meter, but what is needed to, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a tough one because it really depends on the use case. Uh, I can tell you what we plan, plan in the strategy of Wien Energy. So in, until 2030, we want to have 600 megawatt uh, installed uh, power uh, in the greater area of Vienna. So that means uh, a lot of rooftops. Uh, that also means uh, a lot of fields in not densely populated areas. But we really want to push uh, photovoltaic in the future. And it has become quite trendy uh, to have a, a common photovoltaic panel on top of houses. We're doing a very interesting use case here in Viertel 2 uh, with the new buildings up there. There, we also use uh, cryptocurrency chips to, to lock uh, the production of the data. Uh, we include the, the charging stations, but it's still something that's in a rather experimental status. And regarding the time frame, it's, it's something will be there in two to five years. We just don't know yet. We are really actively doing research and we are doing the development where we don't have a, a consumer ready product. But we, we are quite sure that those local energy communities will need all this kind of uh, management uh, from uh, the energy, from the balancing, and also from the billing and settlement, which is not uh, a very easy topic to achieve. Here's a question by the lady and then the gentleman here. Uh, I apologize in advance for the slightly provocative question, um, but you first talked about decentralization and how the blockchain would be good for that. 
but then it's slightly contradictive that if Wien Energy is the one offering a platform and technically and organizationally, like in theory, uh, defining the rules, then in a way it's centra centralized because someone has to develop the whole idea and the whole blockchain, so you're going to preset the rules for all the users. Can you kind of explain <laughs> that a bit better? Well, that's, uh, that's a very good point. Um, Someone's got to do it. <laughs> we don't. We, we have no idea how the business model behind would look like. Maybe it's maybe it's even an open source product. We we have we have no idea how we are going to do it and how we can actually still ensure our business there. It's really something we know there is this technology. It will enable local energy communities, and we need to find our strategy. What's our share of the cake there? Because of course, local energy communities. It's again decentralization. Uh, it's taking the intermediary in the middle out of the game. Blockchain technology is the underlying technology that's there. We want to understand uh, as good as we can, how can we use it to support energy communities, but also not to completely uh, lose our market share there. But you got us there, yeah. <laughs> Gentleman here. Sorry. Oh, thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask if, of all those use cases you talked about, anyone tried to uh, find something that's strictly intercompany, so uh, not between uh, intercompanies, uh, but strictly uh, the trust between uh, certain departments of the organization or something like this? Yes, that's a very good and tough one, and it happens all the time. <laughs> um, we just had this discussion of uh, asset inventory and asset services and can we not use the blockchain technology in order to, uh, to lock uh, the, the current state of our assets and when has the service technician do what kind of uh, done, what kind of uh, service there and, and, and log it in there. But then again, we take a step back and say, okay, we don't want to solve uh, existing issues uh, with new technologies. We actually want to understand how we can make new business and new business models for us as Wien Energy. But it's, it's a trap that we always step into. We always look at what is the existing problem and how can we apply a now emerging solution to it. Uh, we rather want to say what's, what's in, in there in the future. What's, how does the future energy market look like and how does the future business look like? So it's, uh, it's really a lot of discussions that we, are, that we are leading there. But the more we understand about blockchain technology and the more we, we code stuff ourselves, the more we understand, no, we don't want to solve an existing problem. We want to create new business models. Can I have uh, two questions from my end? Uh, so uh, first question is uh, concerning your role. So you're a CIO which means you're senior management, uh, you're responsible for strategy, and you're responsible for organizing work. So uh, you mentioned that um, there's this team of three people, and I wonder how did you actually organize that strategic, this strategic process that ended up having these three people? So you could have had 20 people, you could have had um, these people allocated uh, in your office, you could have them, I don't know, associated with uh, the operations function or the development functions. Which kind of decisions had you, did you consider taking and how did you come up with these answers that you actually had? <laughs> Thanks for that question. As always in life, things happen. <laughs> But uh, how it happened in Wien Energy. So I joined Wien Energy in May 2017, so exactly two years ago. And uh, my boss, who's, uh, who's the CFO uh, of Wien Energy, uh, came to me and told me, we have this blockchain project and I think blockchain is really something we need to look into and uh, I want to do something with blockchain. So like any other... <laughs> Uh, senior leadership uh, at that point in time when we were here in top of the inflated expectations, was like I need to do something with blockchain. And I had just joined Wien Energy and we really had issues in the IT department. So there was really, there was an SAP project. So if you're ever going to do an SAP project, it's not fun. <laughs> it's something where a lot of energy, a lot of uh, monetary and personal resources go into and that if, at the end of the day, yeah you can send a bill. So it, it's really something that's, uh, that's very time consuming, very energy consuming, and usually costs a lot of money. And this project was just at the verge of tipping over and being a failure. 
Um, there was uh, two different uh, parts in the, in the IT department, the ones that were looking into innovative topics and the others who just wanted to do stuff like they always wanted to do. And then I come along and tell them, uh, our CFO has just told us we need to do something with blockchain. And they were like, we have so many issues, we don't have time for this. But uh, with all the strategic, strategic topics, they always seem far away and far-fetched and you don't have time for it because you have to do your daily business. And I, I was uh, somewhere torn in between. Is it already really time to look into blockchain? Uh, my personal understanding was, yeah, it's a technology that enables us to do things, but is now the right time? Well, that decision I couldn't take because my boss really wanted to do something with blockchain. So we started in, in 2017. But along the road, uh, we just learned a few things. Uh, we learned that you have to really build up your own know-how in the company. And as in any big company, you can't just walk up to your boss and tell him, uh, yeah, you just told me to do this task, so give me three resources. So we really had to, to work our way hard. We had to work with uh, interns. We, we had to uh, work with whoever was interested in contributing to this topic. So we had this, uh, this working cycle and all of a sudden 20 people turned up and they were all like, wow, I heard you're doing something with blockchain. I want to be part of it. Uh, that was when it was a hype. And then we learned with the projects, it was a lot of work. We failed. Uh, we did another project. We failed again. And somehow we ended up with this core of three people who are now really the, the main source of knowledge, who can do the coding as well as, the, uh, as they, can, they can look at different blockchain architectures, they can make the decision what's right for this use case, and they can then program it themselves. We are not dependent on external companies anymore. So it was really, we really went along this hype cycle and we really ended up with three people here in the trust of disillusionment, and now we're looking at what's our business models behind. So and how does this operational agenda of these three persons look like? Um, so you organize yourself in smaller projects that you try to complete to understand a use case or how can I imagine that these guys work on a daily business? We have uh, one person who's doing the, the strategic work. Uh, he has worked out a, a blockchain strategy. He's also working with our partners and he's on that topic almost full time. Uh, then uh, we have uh, one uh, trainee uh, he just joined our company like nine months ago. He's in a trainee program, so he's doing different stations uh, within the IT area, and he just loves to try out new technology. So he was uh, a safe candidate to get him onto those projects and really uh, help him work on the coding. And then we have an intern, uh, Suarez. He, she came from Technical University, and she's enthusiastic about coding, and uh, they really want to explore on the strategic side, what are the use cases? Where should we uh, take a look? And then we have the people who are really, really digging into the technologies and trying out things and failing and trying out again and failing again. So it's really one of those uh, tiresome research and development projects. We just have to, have to understand that at the beginning, when it's such an early technology, you will always fail. But with every failure, something you learn and you do something differently next time. So that the, can I imagine that as you maintain a backlog of use cases that you explore? Okay, good. All right, so I look into the audience. Right, there's one more question here. Um, I have a question concerning the communities you were mentioning. So um, what's your idea of the size of these communities? Like, can, would the idea be to, like, me sitting on the other end of the city and being able to trade with you, or a smaller size? And um, within the community, is there also an effort to, for example, if within my community there is no demand for energy, but I'm producing to provide storage and charge consumers, or is this uh, far away from even thinking of it. Yeah, that's a good one because we have no idea how the citizen energy communities will look like at the end of the day because we don't even have the, the legal framework around it. But we're trying some things out here in Viertel 2 because it, it's uh, some kind of a special setup and we're also trying things out in Aspen Smart City. It really will depend on how is the legal framework being set and also uh, how, how is the incentive 
to really become a local energy community and uh, to become a prosumer, not simply only consuming energy, because in the end of the day, electricity at the moment is a rather cheap commodity. It's not something that's, that's really uh, driving people to, uh, for change. But uh, Austria will have to find uh, incentive mechanisms uh, for people to really come up with energy communities. One incentive could be that uh, there's only a very low price for providing the network infrastructure, because that's when you look at your electricity bill, it's one third of uh, what you're paying for. It's just a networking infrastructure. One third is taxes and one third is just really the energy that you're consuming. So uh, I believe that uh, the Austrian government will have to change something to have a real incentivization mechanism why people would actually want to produce and trade energy with, with each other. Another question was here. Um, this is just just for out of interest because I just googled how many employees Wiener Energie has and it's more than 2,500. Two um, so I was, I was wondering how many people do you think should the blockchain department have instead <laughs> of free? <laughs> 500. No. <laughs> um, that's interesting because I don't think I can provide you a fixed number. You can, it, really, it really depends on the use cases you want to work at and it, it depends on the people. There are so many blockchain startups we were in contact with and at the end of that day when you drilled down there were like two or three developers. So you can do a lot uh, with not so many people if they really know what they're doing inside out. And we learned that the blockchain is usually just a very small building block. Uh, we did projects uh, with partners and you still have to do, do all the backend. You still have, you always still have a relational database for, for certain types of information. And then there's only this puzzle piece that is being done on the blockchain. So we try to look at it at a more complete picture because the blockchain, it's just a small enabler or a bigger enabler, depending on what, but it's always a bigger context, a bigger use case, and you need conventional IT technology much more in many cases. But this enabler sometimes just makes the difference. Right, your last chance to ask a question. If not, I would do that. <laughs> right, question here. Uh, my question is once more related to um, the business development, basically, of Fien Energy. Right. Uh, it seems funny that the CFO employed you first because his numbers are optimally if you build energy communities that are prosuming their own energy then your business or your core business would shift from being more of something with a platform provider slash advisor or providing the grid stability or something um, from originating as a yeah, producer of energy. How would you or what's your stance on that? Isn't, isn't that a rather, yeah, once more, isn't that a threat rather than a chance to Wien Energy? Uh, it is to many in our industries, uh, it is a threat. There is a lot of misunderstandings because when you, when you talk about blockchain, it's either, oh, oh my God, it's killing our business or, oh yeah, it's a cool technology. We just don't know what to, what to do with it. Uh, we decided to, uh, to embrace it rather than to uh, see it as a threat because it's something that enables you to do cool stuff that wasn't possible in the past. And uh, nobody could, I still remember when there was no internet, none of you does that, I believe. But uh, it, it really changed the way uh, how we processed information. None is, is going uh, to, or very few people are going to a library nowadays because information is just a good uh, that's uh, available. Nevertheless, uh, blockchain to us, it seems kind of a technology that will be as disruptive and as revolutionary. But we don't know it today. It may be a misconception from our side. Well, then we learn, then we try something else. All right, then maybe I transition to my closing question. So we have here bachelor and master students, also some people from the faculty. Uh, on the one hand, what is your advice? What should they be looking out for? What is important to know? And secondly, which kind of ways are there available for getting involved uh, with uh, Wien Energie activities in this domain? As I mentioned before, there is no real customer products 
out there at the moment and there's a reason behind. So the technology is just not as mature, but there's a lot of uh, things going on. So if you are really interested in the topic, there will be cool applications. I'm very sure about that. Uh, if you want to dig uh, further into the topic, it's, it's really cool. You have here on VU uh, Alfred Taudes, who's, uh, who's really fostering uh, the technology. I think the APC Institute is a really cool thing. You have Shermin Washengear here, who's just uh, going to publish this tokenization uh, works. Uh, it, it's really, it's a very comprehensive work. It's, it's really interesting and also uh, what you can apply here. And you have it here on your campus. You have, to have really good people here on your campus. Uh, you have the possibility to interact uh, with uh, companies like Wien Energy. There's a lot of company uh, partners in the APC. We are often looking for uh, bachelor's or, or master's uh, degree works. Uh, we we are use, looking for interns who want to dive deeply into the technology. So there's a lot of exchange going on. There was just a speed dating session uh, last week uh, where we got in, in touch with a lot of uh, people from uh, VU, but also uh, with other companies. So use it. It's here. It's on site and uh, it's VU people. Right. And you guys see uh, on the last slide, uh, there's not only Astrid's email address, but also her mobile phone number. So I think this is a clear <laughs> indication and an invite for you to reach out. Thanks a lot for being with us today. You're very welcome. <laughs>